Hello and welcome to the AV Forums podcast streaming live on Wednesday the 14th of April 2021 and joining me in this edition Ed Sally. Let me list all the ways you're going to die. Kaz Harlow. Send the cavalry. And Steve Withers. Sometimes life will just punch you in the balls. Welcome back. Uh, we had last week off. Hopefully you didn't miss us too much. Uh, but we're back for you this evening. We're back here streaming live. Um, lots been going on. Uh, lots TV-wise going on. So we've got a bit of a TV-heavy podcast this evening. Uh, so hopefully that'll keep everybody happy because TV seems to be a popular subject. And uh, yeah, uh, we've got lots to talk about. So let's get stuck into it. Kaz, tell us all about the current competitions. Sure. we uh, You can win an SVS SB1000 Pro and 10 runner-up prizes, including isolation feet, sub-leads, and T-shirts. We're coming back to that uh, prize later in this podcast. <laughs> what, sub-leads and T-shirts? <laughs> no, the, the main prize. <laughs> oh, right. Courtesy of the American Audio Company. Thank you very much. Uh, two terabyte Humax Aura 4K Freeview recorder worth 279 And a bunch of 4K yeah. Blu-ray competitions we got, including Fanny Lie Delivered 4K Limited Edition Box Set, Four movie comedy musical Blu-ray box set from Studio Canal, headlined by Catch Us If You Can, uh, the Undoing Limited HBO series on Blu-ray, and Kingsglaive Final Fantasy Fifty Six. Uh, those are all Patreon exclusives, um, and we have regular competitions for Gattaca in 4K, Silent Action on Blu-ray, Journey of a Lifetime, Travels of a Lifetime, utterly unrelated, both on Blu-ray, and of course Criterion's April titles on Blu-ray. So head over to avforums.com slash competitions to enter. All competitions open to eligible AV Forums members resident in the UK. And we've got Excellent. Any previous winners? Yeah, loads, because it's been a, a while. I think we had our yeah, so fair. I decided to actually give out some prizes this time. <laughs> uh, Kellos won a copy of the craft box set. King Mustard won a <coughs> came from beyond space on Blu-ray. GSK2 won a copy of Elysium 4K. Uh, Hawk Moon won Criterion's February titles on Blu-ray. Dapper Dan 486 won Criterion's March titles on Blu-ray, which was a patron exclusive. Uh, Phil O.D. won a copy of Picard Season 1 on Blu-ray, another patron e- exclusive. Oh, I feel really sorry for you, Phil. And St. Maria 411 won Wake of Death on Blu-ray, which was a podcast exclusive. Oh, and Thong 88 won Bloodlands on Blu-ray, which is also... If that's the thong size, I don't want to see you in a thong. Exclusive. (laughs) Uh, Stay tuned for your chance to win a copy of A Discovery of Witches Season 2 on Blu-ray, which is this week's podcast exclusive. Hooray. Excellent. How many wrong wrong answers so far, Kaz? (laughs) Oh, yeah, I'll look them up. I'll tell you in a second. Uh, Martin Gillespie says, hurry up, Champions League 8. Martin, if you're a Liverpool fan... If we could finish at 8 o'clock... It'd be a miracle. Also, can we be clear? First. If you're a Liverpool fan, this isn't this isn't two years ago against Barcelona. I'm sorry, mate. That's this is not how this one turned. They've out. done well this time. Seventy percent have got it right. All right. Oh, okay. Yeah, that must have been too easy. Pretty Liverpool, good. Liverpool I can't, well, it shouldn't have been, but anyway, yeah, they have. Okay. All right. Good stuff. Um, right. So we're we'll back in a sec with some hardware. If you'd like to support the AV Forums podcast on a regular basis, then why not become a patron? Head over to patreon.com forward slash AV Forums to sign up. You can also make a one-off donation through the Super Chat or via streamlabs.com forward slash AV Forums. All donations help us to improve the website and the podcasts. Thank you to all our supporters. Okay. Right, um, patron-wise, Nath has joined us as a patron. Thank you very much. It really is appreciated. Um, all your support is appreciated. So thank you very much if you have become a patron uh, this week or are thinking about it, then you know, please do it. You've got a good chance with the competitions. We will say that. The odds are always stacked in your favour. It sounds it like the Hunger good. Games. May the odds <laughs> yeah. always be in your favour. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We don't kill any of our patrons. Can we just be very? Can we just get that one on the record Not now? Yet, nope, yeah, nobody yeah, nobody pays does. enough money, I'm <laughs> up for it. Yeah, and I have just watched Battle Royale, so. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, um, Stuart's just reminding me in the, the chat window there, and I completely forgot to put it in the running order. Uh, but patrons get 10% discount on our AVF merchandise. Oh, blimey. So, 
So uh, if you see anything that you fancy, you get 10% off of your patron. So I believe go. that um, they've thus far studiously ignored all of our suggestions for, for, for things for the, for the merch because no, most no, of our they're, suggestions they're, were terrible. They're sta- no, they're starting to turn up. So uh, oh, God. it's just uh, just been taking some time to end. Is my got, has my Got Knits one? Um, it's coming. So it's coming. Excellent. Uh, I might actually treat myself to that. So uh, yeah. Yeah, you've just got to give Stuart time to uh, to put the designs together and get them live. But we have got some of the warnings up now, so the warning ones are now live, um, as well as the Delta E's under three and so on. And uh, I'll be I'll be sporting one next week. I'll be modelling one next week. Uh, the delivery didn't quite turn up on time today, so uh, so yeah, I am getting paid to wear it. By I have ordered that um that one I sent put in the podcast conversation with the bloke looking at all the trainers because yeah that was, was just, that was very much you Ed, it really was too on brand to ignore fundamentally yeah. So, yeah. if people don't know ed's got a problem with buying trainers well we'll leave that for now but no, as i say if you wear that one i will before i move into av forums merch I'll, I'll i'll model that in a future podcast so okay i've never seen anyone who was prepared to spend so much money you end up looking like chris griffin <laughs> <laughs> the day I take fashion advice from you is the day the devil goes to work Ooh. in a snowplow. So uh, oh, you know. I'm quite a stylish man when I want to be. Just don't want to be at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Who's been telling you lies again? Go on. Yeah. Um, seven years today for me. Fourteen four fourteen was the last day I had a cigarette. And I'd completely forgotten about it until it popped up on my Facebook memories. Yeah, well, that's that's always, Facebook. always the good, the, always the best way. It's not like you've, you've been there scratching the days into a wall. No, no, no. That's, I, that's I, a really heartening thing. No, I, I just stopped. And, and within a couple of weeks, and if anybody had known me before then, like Steve <laughs> used to... Uh, Used to come to events for me. Having spent and... two weeks in a nicotine stained hotel room. Yeah, I know exactly <laughs> what it was like. Like living on the inside of a yeah. teapot. Yeah. When, when, when we used to we used to open the uh, we had pelly cases for the cameras, and you used to open the pelly cases, and you just get a whiff of cigarettes. Everyone, everyone knew who got a review sample after you knew where it had come from. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. So uh, yeah, I wasn't the only one, though, Steve. So. Um, the less said about review samples, the better. Uh, but yeah, seven years, and I'd completely forgotten about it. Well, well done. It. You know, it's it's yeah. you know, obviously it's both it's life got, it's changing. Gone, it's gone to other areas. So, you you've know. just spent it on super unleaded. I mean, it's still you know it, you still could have switched to I don't know methadone. So I mean, by that standard, yeah. I it's mean, fine. Super yeah. unleaded and chocolate. There you go. That was my downfall after cigarettes. Uh, right. So we got to talk about some TV stuff because there's been uh, lots of things going on TV wise. And I've got a TV review as well. So 2021 TV, which is sitting behind me, uh, which is the G1, which is the OLED Evo. We'll come back to that in a second. Uh, is it an evolution or a revolution? I think we all know the answer to that one, but we'll come on to it in a second. Uh, but first of all, uh, Samsung had their technical demo today. Did you sit through it, Steve? I did. I sat through it for, I think, the fourth time. Because uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I sat through it in December, and then they had the launch at CES, which was yeah, I've sat, the sat through thing. that one. Yeah. They did another one about a month or six weeks ago, which I sat through, and then they did this one. So uh, I, I, it's a joke that I'm going to pinch from someone else, but uh, the base of the headline is Samsung launches micro LED for the fourth time. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, basically, there's nothing to report, really. I mean, the new stuff, we'll have a look at that when it comes in for review. Um, you've seen the pre-production model uh, already, yeah, Steve. I've, I've seen the QN95A. Yeah, so uh, we're just waiting on the retail stuff come through. Uh, we don't do uh, pre-production reviews, so we only review the uh, retail, unless it's a, a, a one-off, uh, very special, like a micro LED TV. Mm, yeah, or the size of a house. <laughs> yeah, then uh, then you know we will look at stuff. But uh, other, otherwise, it's... Uh, yeah, it has to be uh, retail stock. So we're waiting on them coming in. We should have the, those TVs coming through very, very soon. Um, and there wasn't much else to take from the... From the, uh, the no, I don't think there's anything really new there. I mean, it was it was sort of more going into a bit more detail and stuff they'd already announced. So you had the uh, mini LED uh, quantum... Uh, what do they call it? Neo quantum dot. Neo, yeah. Neo, quant- Neo QLED, to be precise, which is basically a mini LED. So that's for the 8K TVs yeah. and the flagship uh, 4K TVs. They launched, they now they they mentioned some of the forthcoming um, sound bars. So there's the the nine five fifty, which is the flagship one, which is going to have um, uh, s- rear speakers that have side firing drivers as well as upward and front firing drivers. So you get a bit more uh, immersion. And um, 
they talked a bit about the uh, about how mini LED works on their TVs. They talked a bit about the neural net processing, uh, and they talked about micro LED. They they really do need to get a TV in a in a shop, yes. a micro LED TV in a shop because they can't keep talking about it without actually delivering something because it's yeah. been going on for three years now. I saw my first demo of a seventy five inch micro LED TV in uh, November twenty eighteen. No, it'd so, been yeah. before that, Steve, because we, we we saw the 75. Well, we saw the wall, CES. but I saw an actual yeah, that was that was shown at CES in January 2019. All right. I saw it in Korea in in before that. And obviously before that they had the wall stuff. But yeah, yeah well, it's I mean, been going on for a while. Obviously, the problem is it needs to be large screen. It's getting it down to the smaller screen sizes, which is the issue at the minute. Um, so you know, it's no surprise that the, the opening gambit is over a hundred inches. Um, it's 110 inch, isn't it? A big lad. And then the other one's a 90-odd inches, and then you've yeah, got the 70, 90, 75 inches. There's going to be a – I think the plan is a 75, 85, 95, and maybe 105 or something like that. Right. So yeah. that's the sort of general idea. But they're all going to be pretty big. And obviously, they're going to be unbelievably expensive. Yeah, yeah. It's premiership footballs, football are, um, price tags, unfortunately. But, I need but to, it needs to be a genuine product. It, they can't keep just talking about it, because otherwise it starts – I mean, the cynical side of me starts to think they're just you doing it to try and screw over OLED. Yeah which we'll come back to in a minute. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, there is precedent because obviously LG with OLED, um, we went to a launch event in Monaco in, in 2012. Yeah, 2012. And it was another 18 months before we saw yeah, it. was product. November 2013 before we actually had a TV yeah, to look before at. Before we ever got a TV. And again, the, the, they'd been talking about it for such a long time as well that it, it eventually got to the point, well, when are we ever going to see this? And they're like buses. They came along too at the same time. I had the yeah. LG and the Samsung. Remember when Samsung used to do OLED? Yeah. We'll talk about that again RG, in a minute. RGB OLED, yeah. <laughs> RGB OLED. Uh, they both came along in space for about two weeks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's that's the next thing. Uh, there's some rumours floating around at the moment uh, that Samsung, who are staunch anti-OLED, uh, with a lot of their marketing in recent years, talking about burning and giving burning guarantees on their TVs and so on, and Always uh, also uh, WRGB not being genuine 4K, yeah, that kind yeah. of stuff. Um, the the rumor is that they are going to go to LG display and purchase uh screens or displays for their TVs. And uh the the uh, the thrust of it really is that they, they're still gonna do QD OLED, uh, but is it gonna be with LG panels? This is this is what the rumor is. Is is this where they're going with it, Steve? Well, um that's quite that. That's certainly a possibility. I mean, if you, I mean, I know they've been working on quantum dot OLED for a while. Apparently, I haven't seen anything. Neither of you, I guess, have you ever seen anything? They they Actually demoed seen it. Seen something? They demoed okay. it at CES, but it was in a hotel, buried away in a hotel, yeah. and uh, it was very select people because basically it didn't work. <laughs> yes. So, so was, I think it's taking longer than they thought it would. So yeah. they, they might be there thinking we could just buy some panels from LG Display. We could add a quantum dot filter. Uh, yeah. And we could essentially create something similar. Now, obviously, there's a degree of face saving that will be required if they took this approach, but it kind of makes sense because if you look at the low end of the market, you know, the red, you know, the sub thousand quid tellies, Samsung's strong. They still dominate that marketplace. At the higher end, they're obviously looking at mini LED, micro LED, and 8K. But the mid market range, the thousand to 3000 price point, is dominated by OLED. Mm. And I think if Samsung wanted to, to, you know, to be competitive in that space, they probably need to go at OLED because um, it would, you know, I think they're not going. I think they're losing ground with LCD TVs in in that particular price bracket. Yeah, um, um, so it kind of makes sense. Could I yes. ask a, a very simple question for those of us who haven't been as immersed in this? Because I've been, I, I, I've actually done some work this week, but. Um, it, it, there's rumors from a number of sources i mean in terms of these sources you guys are the ones that, that have to plow through this stuff year in year out i mean are they people you trust are they people who have been right before uh this came from the korean press i believe ed so right okay they, you tend to be quite reliable on this yeah actually no, that's that's fair they, enough. They do so that's that's where it's initially uh come from so it has hasn't come from a journalist that um, no. This side, anyway, a Western it's, journalist. It's not a random post on Twitter. No, that's no, fine. That's no, good. No, okay, no, there that's, seems that's... to be seems to be some weight behind it. And of course, if it's going QD, then uh, basically that's quantum dot. So what they do is they'll have a, a red and green uh, QD layer, and then they'll use the OLED for the blue light. 
Um, and that's well, how you get your RGB. What I'd so. imagine they would do is they would take the same sort of approach as Panasonic and Sony have been doing, which is to take a basic panel from LG Display and then put your own spin on it. it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Pimp yeah. it up. <laughs> yeah. And that's it's what they would do. That, and they would say or... it's, a, it's a Neo OLED or whatever they want to call it. You know, yeah. that, that would be Or there, conspiracy. You know, so. They just want to buy an enormous quantity of OLEDs, which they're going to stick in a random warehouse so nobody else can buy them. Well, yeah. <laughs> that's, well, yeah. also, I do believe that there are there are supply issues, aren't there, with LCD panels at the moment? So well, um, There is, yeah. LCD panels uh, supply. And the other reason. Cost. But chip-wise as well, Steve, there's a big issues with... Oh, with, please uh, don't talk to me about chip manufacture. It's just absolute yeah. brutality out there yeah and I, I mean i'm lucky that my car got built two weeks ago because uh, flat rock is now uh, uh stopped building completely so there's car lines going down all over the world there's uh microprocessor lines going down all over i mean you would have thought that your mustang yeah. would use valves but you know that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. and uh and and things like uh, graphics cards and stuff like that and and to be honest and... um just in a more relevant to the podcast sense um, the one thing uh, owners of hi-fi equipment will need to be careful about is that in order to make good on some of these chip shortages, certain components are ceasing production, older components, which were being produced in, in, in smaller quantities to keep uh, uh, to work as, 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 uh, as replenishment stock. These things are being taken out of production and it is causing significant headaches in terms of getting hold of parts for old product. So um, there will be examples and it's not really necessarily the manufacturer's fault where they'll reach for the order number of a spare part, a component that your product uses, and it is simply not there because production on it has ceased unexpectedly early. And then another company will have bought the remaining stock of it. Um, it's going to be a mess. Um, and it's going to be one of the weirder side effects of this chip shortage. So forewarned yep. is forearmed. Yeah. So there is that as well. So lots of issues at the moment. Uh, Martin Gillespie says uh, Samsung LG OLED is all over the place. Yeah. I mean, it, the story broke, um, well, it was uh, beginning the last week in Korea, and it took a little while to, but yeah, everybody's picked up on it. Um, so yeah, it's it's going to be interesting. I mean, I'd I'd like Samsung to do it. I'd, I'd I wouldn't hold it against them. Um, I think uh, I, at the end of the day, I want the best TVs. That's that's. I would I'm very much I'm like an best. OLED TV with a Tizen operating system. <laughs> I, I'd yeah, like an RGB point. OLED. I would like an RGB OLED that hits at least at least a thousand nits, if not a little bit more. Um, and and I think you, you're onto a winner there because um, you know the screens that I have seen, no LED screens, RGB OLED screens at a thousand nits, they look amazing. You know the the old Sony BVM uh, two hundred, yeah, that looks fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Um, so yeah, uh, I I I'll would tell you one thing: if they did do it, if they did do it, it would also be an excellent way of getting Dolby Vision on board without losing face because they could yeah. then say we need it now because these don't go as bright as our LCD televisions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, no, totally. So I, so I don't think they can would, kill a lot of birds with this thing. There'd, there'd be a little bit of pushback, I think, from from certain quarters. From a week or two. <laughs> and and then I'd be guessing who they are, but the name's two letters. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then I think it would die down. And at the end of the day, I mean, I think I speak for everybody on the podcast and, and most of our listeners. We just want the best TVs at the end of mm -hmm. yeah. end of the day. That's all we want: better products. You know. <laughs> Uh, don't care about the politics. So, yeah, that's interesting. TCL also had a TV launch today. Um, so I sat through that this morning. Did you sit through it, Steve? It was just, I sat through it yesterday. Was it yesterday? Yes. It was, it was, it was, <laughs> it was Samsung who, this morning. Who, oh, yes, it was, it was Samsung this morning and it was TCL yesterday. Sorry, uh, my days are all mixed up. I don't get out very much. I don't get like out talking to my dad here. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> My, my week's all over the place. So anyway, TCL was uh, Tuesday. It's even written in front of me on the Blink and Run and all yeah. God, I'm just losing it tonight. But anyway, uh, TCL, they announced the micro LED TVs, two models that are who will be interesting, uh, certainly to uh, our listeners, the C72 Plus and the C82 mini LED TVs. I had a look at uh, a TCL last week. No, it's week. the 72. That's not a mini LED, is it? I think it's the 82 that's the mini LED. Is that right? No, it's a 72 oh, I, plus and the, and oh, the 82, wasn't it? They're both mini LED, are they? Because yeah, I wasn't I quite, so. I've got to say, reading the press release, I got the impression, yeah, it doesn't make it very clear. It mentions 82, C82 mini LED, but it never says anything about that with the 72. I'm not sure what the 72 and the 72 plus. 
It's different. Now, you see, I think the 72 plus was, uh, I'm just trying to bring it up myself now. now well, I'm looking at the it. actual news story, and like I say, when I read it yesterday after the presentation, I read the, the press release and thought, hmm. I don't think the 72 is, is mini LED. I think it's just the 82. But, but the 72 does have some pretty good stuff. Like, you know, it's got a full 48 gig HDMI 2.1 connection with uh, 120 hertz panel, EARC, ALM, VRR, the lot. So it looks a pretty well. And they've got Dolby Atmos and Dolby Vision, HDR10+. Yeah. Specs wise, no, both TVs are impressive. Specs wise, yeah. So just having to read through, I think it's just one really bad sentence in the press release, which clumps the C72 Plus and the C82 together. And it's a C82 mini LED TV. So, yeah, C82 so, is mini LED. Yeah. Um, so although the they don't mention how many uh, zones, did they? I don't think they did. No. Just a lot. <laughs> hundreds, yeah. apparently. No, uh, thousands. No, uh, thousands of mini LEDs and hundreds of zones. So, yeah, whatever. <laughs> It's all getting very confusing. Yeah. Well, you see, this is this is a problem where where you get vague releases like this, and and it's all full of marketing jargon, and you know they are named for a technology that's the same as is everybody, everybody else, but with a new name. But, but with a new name, and it just it just muddies the waters and 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 start getting confusion coming in. So well, there's going to be masses of confusion when consumers try and decide what's different between mini LED and micro LED. Yeah. Can you well, I mean. That it, one coming, can't you? They don't even say if it's edge lit or if it's uh, full array local dimming either. So, um, yeah, there's, there's lots uh, what, of things. For the 72? Yeah. So for the 80, the, obviously, the 82 is mini LED, so that's going to be a direct. Yes, direct, yes, direct. But the yeah, 72, no, 72, yeah, they are yeah. pretty vague. Also, what's the difference between the 72 and the 72 plus? Yeah. So well, it's one better or it's a plus better. Yeah. So what I think we need to do is we need to get Marek on the podcast. I think that's what we need to do. So <laughs> yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll send him an email and see if he's got the time to pop on the podcast and, and maybe uh, tell us exactly what is going on with TCL TVs. But I had a look at one last year. It was edge lit. Um, it was mid-market. It was about 500 quid for a 65-inch stonking TV. Had Dolby mm. Vision. Had I Dolby. remember you, were, you, you because From you went into I've it with seen, very little products. expectation. Yeah. They're good products. They just need to a get them out for review. That would be a nice change. <laughs> good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the review sample came all the way from. I think, I, think was, I think it was Poland. It came from. Yes. So, <laughs> well, so yeah, do that this um, year is it? <laughs> yeah. So it'd be nice to get some in for review. And like I say, let's try and get Marek on and uh, and discuss that a bit further. But I didn't have any expectations on the product last year, and it really surprised me what you could get for five hundred quid last year. Uh, Sixty-five inch TV with Dolby. Vision Dolby Atmos. It had an Onkyo sound bar. Um, it was a cracking little TV. So little, sixty-five inch. Uh, so yeah, we'll uh, we'll get Marek on and we'll uh, we'll try and grill him for what is coming out and try and get in for reviews. So talking about TV reviews, I've had the first twenty twenty one OLED in from LG. So it's a G one. This is the one that uh, all the hype was surrounding uh, coming out of CES, and I came on the podcast and what did I say? I said. That's the marketing hype. Let's check it out when we actually get one in for review. And don't get caught up in all the hype and don't go on internet forums and start talking this TV up. It's going to be the next mm -hmm. coming. It's going to be a huge revolution in OLED. And all. It's not. It is not. Drum roll, please. And this is, <laughs> it's, a, it's a G10. It's exactly the same chassis. It's exactly the same design, um, exactly the same inputs and all the rest of it. Uh, it has the Evo panel. Uh, LG is saying it's 20%, and I'm just going to bring my notes up so I can give you accurate figures here because uh, the review has been done. It's just being um, uh, proofread tonight uh, by Andy, and it should be live tomorrow morning. Um, so if you're listening to the podcast live, the review will be up tomorrow morning on the site. Uh, but I just want to get to the figures because the figures is the thing that everybody wants to know about. You know, how bright is this? Get panel? your numbers out, mate. Um, so... Last year, and Steve, you reviewed the G10 last year, even though I spent the majority of the year with that sample. You reviewed I it. Did, yes. So the G10 measured 660 nits on a 10% window and 129 nits full screen. So that's when the full screen is full of white. Same as last year. Um, no, this no, is last, last year. Oh, sorry, sorry, that was yeah, last year. Yeah. I'm coming, I'm building up, Steve. Oh, I'm right, building okay, up. Okay. The <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so that was the G10. Um, those were the numbers. So the, the full screen one is the one that you need to be concentrating on because that's the Achilles heel for, for OLEDs. 
um, when you get a full screen of white or a bright color, uh, the ABL, the automatic brightness limiter, kicks in and normally dims the, the whole set down because uh, it, it creates too much heat and, and uh, it needs to protect the panel and so on. And they can't go that bright anyway. So 129 nits was last year's figure. Um, LG suggesting that uh, this year it's 20% better. Um, so I measured the G1 and the 10% window was 687 nits. So that's what, 27 nits more. Um, but, but the full screen brightness was 152 nits. So it's just under the 20%, because um, that's what, 100, 129 plus 25 point. No, fair eight. enough. So yeah, 152 nits. So it's, and that's in filmmaker mode. What was surprising is if you go into HDR cinema mode, and that's the most accurate um, one after filmmaker. Uh, so it still targets D65 um, and uh, BT2020. So that's HDR cinema, not cinema home, because cinema home is the is the one where all the processing switched on. So HDR cinema is 741 nits on a 10% window, uh, and again, 152 nits on the 100%. And what I found was I went through all the picture sets, even the really blue and inaccurate standard mode and vivid mode and so on. Um, and you're finding that the the figures were generally round about the same. So 100, uh, 152 nits, 100% for vivid. Uh, it was again 162 nits at 100% for standard and 745 nits on a 10% is standard. So it wasn't overly bright. I mean, vivid mode, Again, it was only 745 nits on a 10% window. So it is an evolution because it, they have done the, the 20% and they've gone for the full screen brightness, which it's managed to do. But if anybody's sitting out there thinking uh, OLED Evo is the next coming of OLED, then I'm sorry to disappoint you, but that's that's not the case. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a, a reasonable step forward. It's an incremental step forward. In every other respect, it's the same as the G10. And and believe me, I have spent two weeks solidly testing this TV. Um, and Plus you spent you spent about half, almost a year with the G10, so you've got a, yes, that, you know, you've got so precise I, I know, reference yeah, point. Yeah, exactly. So although I didn't have them side by side, I spent enough time with the G10 to know exactly what it looks like with certain demo um, and test uh, footage that we use all the time and that I know inside out. Um, and I could see with that um, certain. Uh, films like the matrix is a good example you know when they go into the um, program loading area and it's it's completely white background um on on an oled normally that dims down because it's an all white background but they, there was a little bit more brightness there yeah, with the g1 again the revenant which is an old favorite test of mine mm -hmm. um the last section of that film is set within the snow um so you've normally got a, a, almost a full screen of white. And again, it held up really well in terms of brightness. You didn't notice the ABL kicking in. And again, the ABL, the automatic brightness limiter, um, it wasn't as aggressive either. So it was allowing more um, to come through. So yes, there is an incremental difference. Yes, there is a 20% in the full uh, brightness. But like I said, right back at CES, don't get hung up in the hype. Don't get hung up in the marketing because these things rarely end up being what they're claimed to be um, in certain sectors, uh, certain uh, YouTube, American YouTube uh, channels and so on, bigging these things up all the time and bigging up how they've got access to this and access to that. And they don't, it, it, you know, it's all hype and it's all to generate clicks and generate marketing. Um, the actual testing, it does what LG says it's going to do. Um, is it groundbreaking and revolutionary? No. Is it a, a move on from where we were last year? Yes. Um, there's a new UI, so a new menu system on the on the G1, which took me a little bit of time to get used to because you're so used to one menu, and I, I spent so much time with LG TVs over the last few years um, that you you know you could get to the menu without even looking at the TV. You just know the button presses to get you to to set menus and so on. So that has taken a little bit. Of uh, getting used to, but then there are some new controls uh, within the calibration side. Which do you prefer, the old approach or the new approach? I prefer the new approach, and I like the new calibration controls as well. So uh, you now have a gamma correction tool, um, 
within the, the white balance. So you can correct the white balance at 22 steps um, this time and then go in and uh, there is a, a luminance uh, control, not for the RGB, but for actually for your gamma. So you can correct gamma as well. So um, found that incredibly useful to use. Um, and isn't that the adjust luminance control? Wasn't that always there? No, that, no, that's uh, no, no. It's a new control. It's on. Oh, the, it's a or, separate control. It's so a separate part yeah. of the white balance. Yeah, it's 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 now separate. They've, they've done a few things. They've changed a few things around where. They've, um, they've, they've added new names to things. So I'm trying to remember what last year's name was for cinematic movement. Was it Cinema Clear in the yeah, like in, right, in yeah. True Motion? So they now call it Cinematic Movement, but it's exactly the same thing. So what it does is it, it adds a little bit of frame interpolation in, and, uh, but it tries to um, go with the real frames or put as much as possible towards the real frames rather than the made-up frames. So... Um, you don't get as much soap opera effect or you're not supposed to get any soap opera effect. However, if you're like me, my eyes automatically pick up any inter interpolation. Yeah. I can see it straight away. But it will work for some people. Some people will have good mileage with that and it will work for them. Um, so it's it's worthwhile having stuff in there like that under true motion where they're not just going for soap opera effect. They're trying to be... Um, uh, careful with how they're adding in the smoothing so it takes away a little bit of the judder but it doesn't add in so proper effect and so on so they've changed things around they've named uh, a few different things um my big complaint last year was dolby vision iq the fact that all the noise reduction and sharpness controls and everything were grayed out switched on and grayed out as well as true motion switched on and grayed out um, and what you had to do last year was you had to go into the genre menu under the AI menu, go in there and switch off AI genre. Then you could go back into the Dolby Vision IQ menus and then everything was ungraded and you could go and switch everything off. This year, you can switch uh, everything on and off. It's, it's on as default, but you can go straight into that menu, switch everything off. You don't have to go uh, and find the, the genre menu unless you want to change True Motion. True Motion is the only one that's still grayed out. But again, you can just go into the genre menu, which is in another page, switch that off and then go back and you can switch true motion off. So little things like that that are annoying, but they've listened and they've, they've changed a few things. Um, five, five pull downs really good this year. Motion's really good this year. Um, again, you've got 120 that's black frame insertion in there as well, which you can use low and medium uh, work really well. Only with SDR content though, because you do get a drop in brightness. Um, but it works really nice as well. I didn't notice any issues with broadcast material with true motion switched off. Didn't appear to be any um, uh, frame drops or frame skipping going on with that, which sometimes can be a, an issue when you're running true motion, but with it switched off, wasn't an issue. Just above black performance, there's no floating blacks this year. Um, it's the first thing I checked was go to Stranger Things, uh, the, the bit where uh, I live in, in the darkness, walking in the water. Uh, no flashing, no... Um, no floating blacks at all. Um, so that's well done. I checked a few end credit scenes as well, which can sometimes be an issue. And they fade to and fade from black. Um, I don't know what they've done. They've obviously been tinkering with it, but it, it works superb now. So when something fades to black, it actually fades to black. Uh, you don't get any floating blacks or, or any issues around it. So um, there's ones that I use all the time when I'm testing John Wick chapter three right at the beginning. Is a fade to black and it fades out again. Uh, the Revenant, as it fades in at the beginning, as the camera pans over them sleeping. Uh, sometimes you get some issues with that scene. Oh, there's loads of scenes that I checked. Um, so they've, they've fixed that this year, which is good as well. So yeah, it's a strong, solid TV. It's got all the features you want. I mean, the main thing for me is, uh, as well, is, is the gaming side of things. Um, the, the TVs from LG are the most advanced gaming TVs on the market at the minute. Um, there's no getting away from that fact. Um, and you've got everything on there that you could possibly need. And you've got a new game optimizer. So you've got new game optimizer setting as well as a menu. So you can go in, you can change uh, lots of your settings. You can switch VRR on and off. You can go in and change the picture uh, attributes. So you can change the black level. Um, you can uh, go into dynamic tone mapping, switch on the uh, HDIG mode for HDR as well. Um, so it's got everything on there that you could possibly need. G-Sync um, is in there as well. Uh, AMD's FreeSync. Um, 
Yeah, and input lag delay is 12.6 milliseconds, 60 hertz. Oh, and then really speedy. Yeah. Uh, and there's there's a new setting in there as well, which is called prevent input delay. I think that's what they've called it. Um, and what that does is it cuts the input lag again. So it goes from 12.6 to I think it was nine point something or other. Um, so yeah, they've, they've done really well with that. And I've, I've yet to check uh, and test 120 hertz, which should be half of the 60 if it works properly. And obviously the counter to that is that if you do own one of these televisions and you still keep failing at the game, you can't blame it on lag. You're just crap. Yeah, that's that's the point where you have to just put your hands up and say, yeah, I'm not very good at this, which I do all the time. I'm, I'm rubbish at gaming, but I'll give it a go. Hmm. Uh, and the other change, Steve, that you'll be interested in is WebOS 6.0. Um, has been changed. Uh, so it's a new UI. Um, this time it doesn't have the launcher bar along the bottom of the screen. Um, it, uh, it it takes up the whole screen. And I just don't get the logic of it whatsoever. I like the launcher bar because I can keep watching Ancient Aliens as I am. And then I can go and look and see what else I want to watch using the launcher bar or pick something else. And when I want to leave that, then I press the app to open up the app and then I leave the screen. This one, the thing that gets me and the thing that really annoys me with it um, is the fact that, that when you open it full screen, there are three large boxes right at the top and they don't do anything. There's nothing in there of note or of value and it takes up a quarter of the top of the screen. Um, and it just seems to be really odd. And I, the only thing I think of is that they're going to replace these boxes with adverts at some point. That's yeah, well, amazing what I was yep. thinking they're going to be adverts in there later. <laughs> that's that's what I'm thinking. That's that's that, that's where I think it's going on that one. Um, maybe just me being cynical. But then I, I, it's then laid out in layers underneath that. So it's horizontal layers underneath that. Um, so then you get your app list. Or you've got your featured um, or suggested and then you've got layers which are related to apps that maybe you don't have, like Apple TV or whatever. It's like the latest programs from this and that and and so on. And, and it is featured, you know, you, every app you can think of is on here. So Apple TV, Disney Plus, Now, it's now called Now, not Now TV, uh, Prime Video, Netflix, YouTube, BBC iPlayer, ITV Hub, all four, uh, five, I, they're all on here. Uh, and it's also Freeview Play um, capable as well. Um, so it's got everything on there. You've got AirPlay as well. Um, you've got the home dashboard, so you can select sources and so on. I can see why they've designed it the way they've designed it, but I, personally, I don't like it. I much preferred the launcher bar, which which WebOS basically invented that. I, mean, I think uh, everybody else has kind of copied that idea after the original WebOS. So it's a shame they've moved away from the launcher. Their argument, and certainly we asked the question in uh, some of the briefings, was why are you doing this? Uh, and we're basically told, well, um, if you're clicking on the home button, you, you're obviously stopping or, you, or you're sick of what you're watching or you want to move on and you want to find something else. So we're going to open it up as full screen. So that was their explanation. I'm not sure I agree with their explanation. Um, but it is what it is. So that's the WebOS 6.0. It still works fantastic. It's got all the apps you need. It's just I'm, I don't like the new user interface. In fact, it's got more apps than last year, isn't it? Because they've got Freeview Playback. Yeah, so Freeview Play is back this year. Yeah, so you've got a lot more of the apps on there. I mean, it's got every major app you can think of is yeah, is on WebOS. Um, it's the same with Samsung's Tizen. It's got absolutely yeah. everything on it. Uh, and, of course, I have gone in and checked all the apps. So the ones that you need checking, like Prime Video, Disney Plus, and uh, Netflix and so on, they do do 4K HDR. It all works perfectly. They didn't have any issues with lip sync or anything like that. So I've really spent a good two solid two weeks with this TV checking absolutely everything out. And it's a G10 uh, that has just basically uh, upped its game a little bit in terms of the panel brightness, which it's not tremendously bright, but it's a 20% of the promised us. And, and we've got that at the end. So we can't really complain when they say they're going to do something and then they do it. Can't really complain. So the only things I marked against it was that it still doesn't have any DTS audio support. If that's important to you, you're not going to get that this year. And there's no HDR10 plus, which I don't think anybody cares about HDR10 plus. So I don't think that's really an issue. I put it in the cons, but I'm not sure that that really is. A well, I mean, it's, it's, it's so. obligatory. It has to be done. Whether yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. So yeah, so that, I mean, it's a highly recommend. It's a cracking TV, and the design is beautiful. I mean, if you've never seen a gallery series TV, um, the build quality is there. It's all metal construction. It's 
Uh, it's not like a normal OLED that's incredibly thin at the top and then really widens out at the bottom to hide all the electronics and speakers. It's the same width all the way down, 19.9 uh, millimeters uh, thick. Um, there's, you then have all your recessed on the back. So you've got your cable management recessed, you've got your connections are all recessed, and you've got the bit for the wall mount, which the wall mount comes in the box. So uh, if you... It, <laughs> If you want to wall mount the TV, then you get the mount. If you want to mount it on your um, TV cabinet, you've got to, you've got to spend a hundred quid for big... two for two plastic feet. <laughs> or what you could do is you could get the new gall uh, gallery stand, which uses the Visa mounts on the back, so you could use that. Or you could just go on Amazon and buy a Visa mount stand, um, which doesn't take up as much space because if you've got a sixty-five inch TV, uh, it's almost five feet between the, the the feet so you need something it's almost that's well, yeah it's just about five feet it's about 57 inches wide so uh, you need a really wide surface for for that so so yeah it, it got highly recommended it's a good tv it's a really good oled tv they've sorted a lot of the above black issues and all the rest of it so it really is a solid tv it's just not a light cannon which a lot of the hype and a lot of people talking in forums we're expecting it to be the, the next big thing, and it's a it's an incremental improvement. Um, it's still a really strong TV, and it's five hundred quid cheaper at launch than the G10 was last year. That's not to be sniffed at. Um, so yeah, there you go. Uh, the review will be up tomorrow morning if you're listening on uh, Wednesday evening, or it's up now if you're listening a bit later on in the week. Um, so yeah, uh, go check it out uh, if you want to get more details. And I have gone into some depth, as you can tell. Um, it's the first TV of the year, so you really have to check these things out. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll get some Samsung stuff through. We'll get this Sony. I have been bugging Sony quite a bit to get hold of uh, A90J. There just isn't any samples at the minute, but as soon as there are, uh, I have been promised one. Uh, and we'll also have Sony on the podcast very soon as well. More details on that. Um, a little bit later, uh, probably next week, we'll give you some details on that. Right, so that's uh, me done at the minute. I've talked enough. You've had enough from me, Scottish twang. Um, I thought you were going somewhere completely different there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so you've got your new TV. You've read our reviews. You're going to, and you're going to buy them. Steve, where are you going to stick your TV? Opposite a window, a really bright light source so you can move that picture. <laughs> Uh, yeah, don't do the following. Don't stick it over a mantelpiece, over a fireplace, because it's too high and you'll be that, craning your that neck is, the whole time. That is the biggest mistake that people make when they get a flat panel TV, an OLED or whatever. Um, they put it over a fireplace, and that is the worst. But even if it's it's not a fireplace that's used, just the height that you're putting it at is, uh, yeah, it, you're going to yeah. crick your neck. You're going to have neck. Well, you're going to have to crick your neck. And if it's an LCD television, you're going to get, um, you're looking at it off axis. Because don't forget, off axis isn't just left and right. It's also above and below. So uh, don't don't put it over the, over the fireplace, for God's sake. Uh, and don't put it opposite a window. Don't put it opposite any l very bright light source. If you can, yeah. I know this is difficult because, you know, every lounge is going to have windows in it. Um, and you're gonna, you know, yes, it's generally limited. speaking, normal people consider that to be a feature. I'm just if you go into it, yeah, if you go yeah. into the average living room, you're gonna have one wall where there's a door, one wall where there's a fireplace, and one wall which is which is windows, well, just, which just doesn't leave look, you many options. <laughs> yeah, well, you just have to look at my room so you can see my room behind me. Yeah, so I've got that window over that side, but there's a window right next to me here on my uh, right here. Um, so you see where I have the TV, I actually have the TV at an angle. So it's not facing directly at, at the window that's here. Um, but I can't get away with it any other way because I've got a window at each side of the living room. Um, during the day, that's why I have the TV stand angled around so it's not directly, uh, I'm not directly getting the light through the window. And it's off slightly. If you're wondering why my TV is never in the center of the room where it should be there really next to the window, it's the reason it's off at the side is because, again, to try and avoid reflections and, and light coming into the room. So... Think about that very, very carefully. Um, obviously, the TV yeah, yeah. right next to me here is is ideally positioned because it's not getting hit by any of the light coming in directly. Wait, so. What is that? Is that the G one? No, that's a that's a Samsung um, 90R Q90R. Huh, huh. So it's actually got the right light rejection 
uh, on it so it rejects light so yeah in my room there's two small windows on on the as you're sort of standing in the room on on the left hand side on the right hand side there's a door into the kitchen behind me is the fireplace and in then in front of me is the tv uh, it's a damn convention i sit with my back to the fireplace so that i got the tv on the correct wall <laughs> Although, you know, obviously I'm old enough to remember a generation, you know, back in the 70s when TVs were A, only this big, and were hidden away in cupboards in yeah. the corner. And you'd hide them away because you were ashamed that you had a television because it was, you know, it was so working class. Yes. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, these days, you know, I mean, tr I know people stick them in corners and they still, and, and obviously there's always going to be a degree of um, compromise just because of the way room, your average room is designed. Um, yeah. But yeah, primarily don't put it too high and don't put it opposite a strong light source. Yeah. If you can avoid those two things, you're already in, you know, going well. If, you, if you're going to put right about the fireplace, think about changing the fireplace. Is, is it working? Is the fireplace going to be working? Um, if it's not, if it's just there with some light in it to, it's just to decorative, look like, yeah. It's yeah, if it's decorative, it. then, then fine. You know, try and position that a little bit lower and position the TV just above it or whatever. Um, or try and go to the side if you can. The main thing is OLED, you should be okay in terms of um, uh, the Access. spread of the spread of uh, seats and viewing angles and so on. You should be fine from most points in a room with, with an OLED, depending on where you end up putting it. LED, LCD, you have to be really careful with because um, you do have issues with viewing angles because of the technology. Um, and like Steve says, if it's too high and you're looking up at the TV, then you're going to wash out the picture. The same is, you know, if you're off too far to the side, like the image that's on the screen at the minute, for those of you watching uh, the video, sorry for those watching uh, audio only, you can't see it, but uh, the couple sitting off to the side of the TV that's on the wall with Ambilight, um, that's the wrong angle to be looking at a TV. Isn't that, that's old school Ambilight is, as well, yeah. isn't it? In a giant <laughs> yeah. old LCD. That TV's a bit too high and it's uh, a bit too old. the wrong position. It's the opposite of <laughs> the television. But, um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, um, you know, or you could do what Ed does and just put it above the drinks cabinet. Yeah, it does it's not above the drink. It's above. It's <laughs> above. Uh, ultimately, it it by the standards of what you've just been talking about here, it is approximately eight inches too high. However, it needs to clear the turntables. That's important to me, and I'm quite happy to sacrifice eight inches of perfection. Not a euphemism, in order to actually have the turntables. Wish. <laughs> the turntables where they need to be. Um, uh, ironically, it's a it's a better height in this house than it was in my last house because, as well as the turntables in the old house, it had to clear a wall-mounted centre speaker, which it no longer has to do. So it's 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 commensurately lower. Um, uh, I mean, I would say I guess I'm so used to looking at a turn uh, at a sorry a television which is fractionally too <laughs> fractionally too high. It's completely normal for me now. Um, it's I can't I don't know exactly how far off the off the, the floor mine at, it is, but yeah, it, it looks it looks fine. Ed. It doesn't look as high as as uh, as one that would be above a fireplace. Oh no, it's nowhere near that. I mean, it would have to be yeah. a fairly dinky fireplace. But equally, I mean, I chose this house because the fireplace had been dispensed with some years ago. Um, being boring, practical, and um, ruthlessly ca ruthlessly capitalist for a moment. Um, if you are thinking about removing a fireplace in a room, one, just check how old is the fireplace? Is it a valuable one? Because if you're getting rid of something which is of quite substantial value to the property and you don't envisage being there for the rest of your life, in terms of mounting your television, you might make a gain, but you could be absolutely monstering the value of the house. So do be careful getting shot of them find other solutions if you've got an expensive functional fireplace in a house that you've just moved into yeah and i guess the the other thing that you have to think of uh, in your room and where you're going to position your tv is if you've got an audio system uh, so if you've got a sound bar then obviously the sound bar just goes underneath the tv so you just need to keep that in mind a lot of them can be wall mounted as well as the tvs these days uh, most of them are designed actually uh, mm. some of the design ones are designed to go in the wall anyway so uh, bear that in mind. But if you're going to put a full 5-1 system in, or like Ed, you want to have a nice stereo system as well, then positioning the TV between uh, the left and right speakers, um, even if you're not going to have a center speaker, is the ideal thing. So keep that in mind, bear that in mind, and uh, make sure you set it up so 
if you don't have a center speaker, you at least uh, tow the speakers in enough to give you the the phantom speaker, phantom yeah. center speaker, um, and it should work perfectly perfectly fine. Um, again, it's all going to come down to your decor and so on, and and what your 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 other half or uh, who you share the the house with uh, is agreeable to. But um, yeah, just the main things to avoid, as Steve says, is uh, is the windows. Don't put them opposite windows. Don't you can't them avoid the windows, light. or there's a lot of windows in the room, and uh, obviously invested some decent curtains with some blackout material in them. I mean, yeah, the, the, the don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, for all the increase in wall space, I mean, when you think back to when you were trying to accommodate a 32 or a 36 inch CRT, I mean, those were those were room dominating monsters. Well, a 32 inch CRT or, or bigger. Um, it was it was actually there was more depth than there was screen width, so you would actually be coming out probably about three three and a half. Yeah, feet they from corners the quite well actually. <laughs> well, that's why they went into corners, wasn't it? Because that was ideal. They were kind of corner was, shaped, weren't they? Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's um, what they should be. Yeah, but yeah, they were enormous. So I mean, things have got better, um, no question. I mean, I suppose the other if you've got. Um, if you are balancing uh, fireplace existence with uh, the need to the, the desire to have uh, a, you know decent screen size, is this not potentially? I mean, this is more Steve's area, area of expertise than mine. Is that not potentially classic short throw projector territory? Because you could theoretically just drop the screen in front of the fireplace, provided it wasn't on. And well, sort of short, you know, short ultra short throw. Oh, the ultra short would throw. Have to be We'd be right next to the fire then, wouldn't it? So well, no, we can, can they not be, are they, is it not possible? Wheel it in. Well, I don't know. I mean, the, the, it always strikes me as a bit of a, of a limitation to the to the market appeal of these things because they're notionally a way of, without, impercept, you know, making huge impact on the room, getting a giant screen. But if then there's considerable sort of loop, holes. No, which, what, what they can be good at is the ultra short, ultra short type adjusters to ones that you put, say, 10 centimetres from the wall. They can be hidden away in furniture, in in sideboards. Yeah. Essentially, yeah. they can be quite. They can be very discreet, and you could have what looks like a you know a sideboard on a um, sofa. In your, yeah, and well, I mean, yes, they, they, they often make the projector itself look like it's a, a soundbar on steroids. Yeah. But um, you can actually, I've seen them, and some companies even offer this furniture where the um, the uh, the speed sorry the projector is down in the in the in it's like a, a, a thing you open at the top and it's inside the cabinet so that it projects up onto the wall but when it when the cabinet is closed you don't even know there's a projector there um mm. and that can be a great way because then you have a you have a cabinet a side cabinet um and then when you want to watch tv or a movie or whatever then you just open up the top and you're off you, it projects onto the wall um and you're away and uh that can be very discreet uh, and obviously if you've got a, a wall that's not being used for anything else it can it can be you know quite effective use of space within the lounge yeah. I mean, for them to work their best as well, you, you do need a light rejection screen to get the absolute yeah, best. Yeah, ideally. ideally. So, so again, you know, if you're going to have a screen, you'd have to have, uh, and, and they're normally fixed, Ed. So that's the problem yeah. with the light All rejection right, well, screen, you know. they're normally fixed. But yeah, no, it, it's another solution. But anyway, um, just avoid the pitfalls, really, uh, or, or try and get around them if if, uh, if you've got a difficult living room, like I have here, you know, just using little tricks, repositioning the TV slightly and so on. Um, if you're going into a corner, which is a popular choice uh, today um, for some living rooms, just think about your audio uh, is what I would say. And think about who's watching the TV, especially if it's an LED LCD, um, how wide uh, are, are the chairs from the, the viewing position? Just think about stuff like that, because um, as soon as you get off axis with any LED LCD TV, even those that say that, they have an IPS panel that, and and so on. You're still going to get color shift. You're still going to get uh, issues with contrast drop and so on. And IPS is terrible for contrast as it is. So, yeah, don't sit off. Right. I think we've covered enough of this. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about something different. Let's talk about a boom boom box. Steve. Or subwoofer, as people over seven call. Them. It's a boom boom <laughs> box. Yeah, I'll make this quick because it's already on the on the on the site, and um, I want to get Kaz back in for movies but uh, basically yeah I, i've recently reviewed the svs sb 1000 pro so svs have been sort of going down their range gradually upgrading them so last year they were doing the 2000 series and giving out the pro treatment and now they started on the on well they've gone down to the 1000 series 
and given that the pro treatment so you've got the sb1000 pro which is the sealed one and there's the pb1000 pro which is the ported version um the ported version is only available in one finish which is the uh, black ash with the uh, sealed version you get a choice of black ash which is 549 pounds or you can go for the um the glossy black or glossy white which is 639 pounds which is the same price as the ported one um i i definitely personally prefer the black ash finish um more discreet typically in a, in a darkened home cinema and the glossy black one just is a fingerprint magnet but uh i've got to say i thought this was an absolutely cracking sub um essentially what they've done is that they have uh it's not you know it's not a casual upgrade it's a reasonably decent upgrade first of all they've upgraded the driver it's, just, it's a 12 inch driver i mean this is it's, it's a small sub and pleasingly light and, and easy on the back Considering compared with some of the other subs I've had recently. But, oh God, moving uh, some SVSs is like a Cecil B. DeMille film. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is relatively, it's still a well made, very well made, but it's not quite as heavy as some of the other models. Um, it's basically all driver. You know, I don't know how they've managed to fit this 12 inch driver into something this this compact, but they have. Uh, they've beat up the, uh, app, the sledge amplification a little bit, um, and they've included the remote app, which is awesome. So that alone makes it worth price of admission and at 549 pounds it's one of the few other than maybe paradigm the only one i can think of that's in a similar price bracket that has a remote app and remote uh, having an app a remote control for a sub is godsend because you can sit at the sweet spot and you can muck about with the levels and, and anything else without ever having to get off your ass and you know anyone who's ever had to crane their neck and fill around down behind in the darkness trying to change something on a sub and then go back and take a measurement and then go back to the sub have to do any of that not with the remote app it's it's fantastic and you can do some really cool stuff with the remote app so it's well worth having it's compact it's well made and it i don't know how they do it but it's it's it goes really deep i've had a 20 hertz and it's not that big um uh, it's a superb piece of engineering I'd, I'd be curious to see uh how much better the in terms of you know deep bass the ported version is because obviously that's a bit uh, quite a bit bigger um and um I think last, I think the, the old PB1000 was a 10 inch driver. And this is so it's the new PB1000 Pro is a 12 inch driver with two ports. And you can adjust the ports using the remote app, which is another nice feature. So if I'm shoving in um, bone bungs. Uh, but it's it's a really good, this little, if you're looking for uh, a really good, and particularly if you've got, if you have your limited space and you want a really good, really powerful, controlled, tight, and surprisingly deep, compact. Uh, entry level you know affordable subwoofer then uh, 549 quid this is an absolute stonker and you get a remote app as well um great value really great value i loved cracking boom boom box yeah thank you very much steve mm. top top draw boom boom <laughs> excellent uh jazz 6004 has done and, and, and sorry i was gonna say, sorry i was gonna say and it's a competition prize so Enter. So go and win one. Enter yeah, the competition. Yeah. What's better than five hundred and forty-nine pounds? Not pounds. Yes. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. Sorry. And sorry. One other thing. Uh, I should is uh, apparently they're in very short supply because they're on the ever given. <laughs> Stuck in the Suez Canal. <laughs> not, not anymore. Not anymore. That little digger. No. No. No, no, have you not heard? Yes, it, they got it out. It, it was stuck, obviously. It's now sitting in a massive lake halfway down the Oh, Suez so it's Canal. still in the Great Bitter Lake? No, so I, I didn't know that. The Egyptians have kept it in the lake and they're not letting it go unless the insur the, the company that owns the Ever Given should cough up 900 million <laughs> in costs. Oh, right. Okay, fair enough. Right, okay, that's so a, that's get, go get your sub subwoofers then, people. Go get them before that. If you can't buy one, enter the competition because yeah. that might be your only way. <laughs> Can I can I do the donations now? Are you, yes, are you, are you done now? Are you? You're not going to come yes. in with any anything else, okay? Oh, right. uh, so Jazz six zero zero four has donated five pounds. Thank you very much uh, for your donation. It is appreciated. Uh, there was no message with that, so um, well, so, just thank you very much. Thank you for your donation. It is appreciated. Uh, right, so we need to move on. We need to do software, and that's coming next. <laughs> If you enjoy the podcast on YouTube, then please like and subscribe. If you're listening to the audio version, then please leave us a rating on your podcast app. We invite you to email questions and feedback to podcast at avforums.com and join in with this episode's discussion thread in the podcasts forum at avforums. Ed, give us your album of the week. Right, bit of an odd one this. Um, 
as regular listeners will know, I am a genuine, I don't mean an ironic fan of world music. Um, there is some magnificent stuff happening around the world and it's only fair that we celebrate it from time to time. This is a new one for me. This is a uh, three-piece band called Delgris. Um, they are um, f originally from Guadeloupe and uh, they've actually been churning out albums for five or six years now. Their latest album is called 4AM and it is a take on both the sounds of Guadeloupe um there are some of the sort of creole uh cajun slash delta blues influences that have gone in there as well um i just think it's a bloody good listen it's a diff it's a bit different to, to other things there's a, a mix of singing in french singing in english um and so on and so forth uh it's on all the major streaming services and in the absence of anyone else delivering an absolutely knockout blow for the last two weeks I thought it was worth bringing something a little bit different to people's attention. I don't expect everyone to love this one, um, but nevertheless, I thought it was a good listen. I thought it was entertaining um, and, you know, broaden your horizons. We shouldn't all be listening to the same stuff all the time. See where we go from there. Okay, good stuff. Uh, I had to listen to that. Not really my thing, um, but there was a couple of decent tracks on there which I, I, I did enjoy. So some of them shift; they do have a, a, a good a good sense of groove and timing. But I grant you, it goes all over the place. Um, yes, but yes. A, a little a little inconsistent. But this I'll, Friday is supposed to be a big day for music, so hopefully something a little bit more mainstream for a recommendation next week. Okay, good. I always like your recommendations, so I keep them coming, Ed, because it, it it keeps my week going when I get new recommendations and new music. Right, let's go uh, and talk about some film, TV, and disc news, Kaz. Sure. Um, well, I was. Uh, I feel I would feel remiss in not dedicating all my time on what I think is one of the best films I've seen this year, which is um, Sound of Metal. Uh, a lot of people would have come across this <laughs> last year because it was released uh, in the US, November time, uh, perfect time for the Oscars. And, um, and it's taken its sweet time coming out here, possibly because I think they planned a cinema release and then they ummed and ahed about it. And then Amazon picked it up. Um, I mean, Amazon have, have really been knocking it out of the park oh, recently. had a great week between this okay. and, and um, Palm Springs. It's, yeah, Palm it's Springs a... and uh, Mauritanian. Yeah, um, and the Mauritanian. Yeah. Which which I absolutely loved. I mean, they've they've I think they've had a really good year actually. They've 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 done well with some some good titles that I uh, I perhaps wouldn't have expected from Amazon. It looks like they're really trying starting to take it seriously yeah and i appreciate this isn't an amazon uh, original in the sense that they've clearly bought it um but nonetheless credit to to picking good titles so, to buy so why should i uh, so why should i watch this cause what's it about okay so the the, sto the story is about uh, it's riz ahmed and he plays um a drummer heavy metal drummer who um notices that his hearings He's a basic yeah. performance upon Stuart, I believe. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> massively, massively uh, gone down. And he, he goes to see a doctor about it. It's, you know, it's not great news. And uh, his, his girlfriend's the lead singer in the band. Uh, they've got a, a tour planned. Uh, they live their life in a trailer going from one gig to the next. And that, that it's, you know, it's a happy life they have. But I mean, everything in his life is is centered around being able to hear I mean, perhaps even more so than than everybody else i mean it's literally he needs it for his job uh, he arguably needs it partly for his relationship because his job is kind of tied to his relationship with his girlfriend and uh you know it's it, everything it's su it's such an overnight change um, and what, what Sound of Metal does differently is it uses the soundscape to put you as, you know, as much as a, a person with hearing can be put into this kind of frame of mind of, of someone who is losing their hearing and has to deal with the, the various effects of that and the options available, like, you know, implants and uh, operations and, and everything from that. Um, it's tremendous. It, it had uh, echoes of um, The Wrestler, 
for me. And uh, whiplash. It's a, it's Angry drummer. Uh, yeah, I mean, I yeah, I I get the whiplash kind of sentiment, but it's I don't know whether it's, it's that more much about, about it's more about drumming. whether you continue to push on to your yeah. inevitable inevitable catastrophic end because that's what you're good at and what you do, or whether you step out and try and find your way place in the world, yes, having stop doing what you want to do. It's certainly, I mean, what certainly, whiplash was kind of about, wasn't it? He's he's certainly in a world of denial and i really really felt for him he wasn't he wasn't a desperately likable character because he played it very honestly which is like no you know maybe it'll get better you know maybe i can i'll have this operation i'll have this i'll do this and it'll just go back to normal and it was a, a permanent state of denial whilst his whole world was changing around him um, anyway, he, 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 you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's a tragic, uh, emotionally wrought voyage. And our um, house performance from uh, it, yeah, I mean, he's phenomenal and it utterly convincing. As I say, he doesn't play it like a desperately likable guy, but you know, he, he, he does it. He nails it really well. I mean, every little nuance of it, he does it well. He makes fine frustration language. Frustration, the situation he's in. Yeah. Is, is, also, yeah, so since it's an AV podcast, the sound design is amazing. It's it is. It's it's never been done before like this, and and it's already won BAFTAs. I can't I can't imagine that they they're not going to give it the Oscar for sound design. Yeah, but I definitely going to win that. <laughs> yeah, but I do feel sorry for them because I, I if I feel like the Oscar committee, surrounded by things like Nomadland, which has done well, and The Father, and the notion of giving uh, Chadwick Boseman a posthumous Oscar they might look at this and go hey we'll give it sound design and then we don't have to give it anything else uh, but well, it wouldn't actually, be the first time that that's happened Kaz, is yeah. it where you give no, it, no you, i know you damn it with faint praise i just i just think that it's 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 really it's very very well put together and very resonant uh, and at a, at a personal level which you know isn't going to inform everyone's view of it i mean the the story was it was written and directed by Darius Marder. He co-wrote uh, Derek Cian France's Place Beyond the Pines, and he worked with Cian France on that. And Cian France wanted to do another uh, movie, a, a documentary about a, a deaf drummer, a deaf metal drummer, and that project fell through. And he took it up and made it into a narrative feature. And he he had a relationship, uh, a very close relationship to his grandmother when he was a child. And his grandmother um, from, uh, I think it was an antibiotics injection, uh, suddenly went profoundly deaf pretty much overnight. And it apparently it deeply affected him, the, the writer director of this movie. And he, uh, I, I think it informed the narrative here. And on a personal level, my, my, um, my uncle has been profoundly deaf and it's all I've ever known of him. And I've probably kept, carried around a modicum of I don't know whether I don't know whether you could call it guilt, but a a feeling of helplessness, stroke guilt that I've always thought, you know, if he was born at a different age, he could have had like implants, he could have had all kinds of other things that would have made his life so very different. And uh, the movie, um, uh, you know, for want of a better term, without getting too emotional, has uh, has alleviated a lot of that because it's somehow revealed a different side to deafness and a different side to the um the difficulties of of any attempt to 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 correct it if correct it is the right term um it's uh it's very it's a very moving piece it's well worth watching i mean it, you know the way they muffle the sound it's not permanent, which is really interesting because you, you watch the movie like you'd watch any normal movie. And then occasionally you realize that the sound has shifted to his perspective. And it's so disorientating. It's like, it's-, it's They do a bit like the design, sound design, I think was in gravity when they're in space because you, sound obviously doesn't travel through a vacuum, but yeah. you can feel it. And yes. when you're deaf, you can still feel yes. space yeah. and lower frequencies. And well, so, um, Dame Evening Glenny, the drummer. Yes. Uh, the percussionist, she, uh, drummer. The, the Olympics. That's what she does. Yes, I mean, she, she is, she's deaf and essentially, yeah, she do, doesn't stop her being utterly phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a, a, good, a, a good friend of my grandfather's 
uh, he um, he went deaf overnight because uh, he uh, ignored uh, instructions during a firing drill on a battleship and found himself above deck when they fired all the guns at once. Oh. Um, and yeah, he went from having very reasonable hearing to no hearing in the space of one very eventful day and then had lived with that for the rest of his life and um, was far more um, at peace with that than I suspect I ever would have been. <laughs> under the circumstances although i guess you can only be angry for so long <laughs> yeah i mean certainly they, they do well to portray the, the different yeah. so places. how can i watch this guys is this uh rental or is this no free no, no this, oh, is, amazon this is prime. amazon amazon prime is it okay. you got amazon you got it they they uh, put it in 4k with hdr it's not a it's not a look it's not a, a demo piece but it's really nice that they've rendered it in 4k and it looks very filmic and that's included um, in your subscription. It is I mean, included you know, in your subscription. As you, you say, can annoy it, people without it. But it does look like Amazon is starting to try. Yeah, yeah. I, I've yeah. I've been impressed with Amazon this year. I've got to say they they've really uh, turned it around. It, it wasn't a service I would look at normally, but um, yeah, I, I, I've been watching quite a bit on there recently. So I shall check this out when I'm in the right frame of mind, I think, because I think... Yeah. Uh, and also check out Palm Springs if you haven't already watched it, because that's a great... I have to great say time, that I will time probably comedy. I love a good time loop movie. Over so it's this, right. because yeah. I need something happy in my existence, but nevertheless... That, that's that's what I was thinking. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure it's I'm sure it's a great film, and I will get around to watching it, but I don't come in the right frame of mind at the minute, to be Well, I know. I mean, be, Springs, be, in what yeah. reference to what Kaz was saying, I had to build myself up to watch The Wrestler, and it still shredded me. So, yeah, um, I yeah I mean, I'm, you know... It's, I, I absolutely love the wrestler, and so so the comparison there for me is is a movie where you see someone you know put everything into it and lay it on the table. Um, yeah, it's and when I say it's it's tragic, it's it's resonant more than you know about a, a movie about a bunch of people who just die. It's it's a resonant, moving movie. It's just a tragic set of circumstances. Yeah, cool. Um, well, yeah, I'm, I'm finished. Uh, I finished reviewing TVs now, so I, I can stop watching things that I've watched a million times on loop and start <laughs> watching some new things uh, until okay. the next TV comes in for review. Oh, so, okay. thanks very much for that, Kaz. Um, right. So, what have you been watching? Um, I'm going to be very quick because, like I say, I've been reviewing TV, so I've been watching a hell of a lot of new stuff. Um, but I did watch uh, the short series of Top Gear, and I also watched the 30 minute uh, Sabine Smith special. And I've just got to say the uh, the special in Sabine was fantastic. It was an absolutely brilliant piece of TV. The only thing that annoyed me about it, and I think I know the reasons why it happened, but the fact that Chris Evans couldn't take part in it or didn't take part in it, I thought was, uh, I, I didn't think that was very good. And I don't know what the reason, actual reasons are that he didn't take part because everybody else managed to put things to one side and come back and, and say some nice stuff about Sabine, and yet we didn't hear well, from uh, Chris Evans. So that was the I don't thing. think it affected the body of the program. No, it didn't. I just thought it was annoying that he didn't take part when somebody like, uh, uh, you, you know, everybody else did, even if it was just via video link. Or Presumably they had to put it together pretty quickly, didn't they? Because she only died a few weeks, a couple of weeks ago. So yeah. Um, Maybe yeah, he just wasn't available, you know, he's a busy guy. <laughs> I don't know. What, yeah, I don't know what he's doing these days. But, uh, but anyway, no, nevertheless, it was, it, really, was, it was a really good special. It, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was a good special. And, and it, I, I, it covered all the points that needed to be covered. About. And I've got to say the series have been fantastic, even though it's been a short series. I know they've made 10 of them or they're going to make 10 of them. So there's another six to come um, probably over the summer or, or maybe just after the summer. So. Uh, looking forward to to those because it's been fantastic. Uh, Air crash investigation. Do I need to say any more? Other well, than it's back for a new series. Uh, the first one was the seven three seven Max episode, um, which I thought they covered very fairly. In fact, it's probably the only way they could cover it by just mentioning the facts and nothing else. Um, hmm. But it was a really put, well put together. To be fair, the facts in themselves are relatively damning. <laughs> you know, so, yes. Yeah, they don't come out of it well. <laughs> so uh, we'll I mean, yeah, it. <laughs> it, it, it just, it, it, but it's, if you like, in so it, you know, it's been reflected in so many episodes before. It's, we've done it before and it's fine. And it, that sentence will haunt various people for the rest of their lives because they did a variation on something that had been done before, but it's just pushing and pushing and pushing a design and a piece of increasingly elderly equipment 
in ways that it was never designed to be done and it's re it is reflected extremely well in the program um yeah. i mean obviously if i was boeing i'd be slightly aggrieved that uh it's not the it, it's not the order that the, the programs are were shown in in the us because uh it weirdly not now and sky tv show you the episode number even though it's not the episode number that's relevant to um the episode that Sky's shown, uh, but obviously Monday's episode also featured a seven three seven. Yes. <laughs> so, so, so for the last two weeks, hard. for the last two weeks, there's been seven three seven. It's like, oh Christ, I'm not getting on a seven three seven again. Look at that. Um, well, <laughs> but, well, I'm not getting on a seven three seven again or any other plane for that matter. <laughs> Oh, that's it from you, is it? You're not going yeah. abroad? Seriously, you're not? Is that it? If I can possibly avoid it, I'm not going abroad. <laughs> Unless I'm just paying a lot of money. Oh, and, and something, it has to be something quite saucy to get another plane. <laughs> that, well, no, no I don't, I'm not going to critique that. I just think that's quite a quite a bold statement. I really haven't. I mean, no. I mean, well, it's been a year and a half now, and uh, I haven't missed going I, on trips. I haven't missed it either. I mean, I, I, there, there's been some offers come in for stuff, and I've turned them down quite easily because, yeah, it's... Uh, not for me at the minute either. And uh, probably the same for CES uh, coming up. I don't think, uh, I don't even think we'll be right to go and do that. So, yeah. No, it's fair enough. Be. But yeah, uh, Air Crash Investigation is back. First two episodes. Is that uh, on uh, so it's now TV, is it? And, yes. And Sky. It's not yeah. on Disney yeah. Plus. Not no, even, much not to my annoyance. They National Geographic. They do. Yes, they do. But I think they're contracted to... Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but what annoys me about that is that they may be contracted to Scott, and I would quite accept them not having the latest and greatest episodes, but I'd, I'd love to have the library available. Yeah, there's, there's, there's probably a licensing issue somewhere around that, but don't worry, Disney's going to own the world very soon. Uh, there's so much stuff on there as, as it is. I've yeah. been going through Star, and there's a ton of really great movies in there. And yeah. uh, I watched one called Hitchcock, with um, where um, Anthony Hopkins is playing Hitchcock, about the making of Psycho. Great film. You should watch it if you haven't seen it. Can I just say that uh, I did post this on I did post this on Twitter and then I went ahead and did it. I watched first the gone original in 60 seconds. Gone in 60 <laughs> seconds on Amazon and then the remake on Star. And I was still able to form sentences at the end of it. Um, which I think is quite an achievement because yeah, um the, the original's a, good, the the the, the remake, mm. not so much. Not I just so I my, my my single favorite, if you like, attention to detail in that is Angelina Joni's character going on about how uh, going straight is incredibly expensive and she's working 11 jobs. And then when she turns up to help, she turns up on a £27,000 limited edition motorcycle. <laughs> uh, it's like, that's not quite how it works. But no, um, I, I managed to do both of them back to back. I've scratched that particular itch. So uh, yes. Nigel Henry, um, like we said, it's on Sky, Natural, Nas National Geographic on Sky or Now TV, or Now as it's called now. Now, yes. Now, now. It's now, new, now, now. but still slightly ropey interface. <laughs> 720p, or is it now 1080? Uh, it's been a while that depends well. on whether you pay the extra three quid for Boost. Oh, but I refuse oh. to do. I refuse to give To it be honest, I don't mind. I'm minimum. I'm quite happy to watch uh, Forged in Fire and um, uh, Air Crash Investigation in Gloria 720p. It's quite nostalgic in its own <laughs> way. So, uh... Yeah, well, that, that's what I've been watching. So uh, what have you been watching, Ed? Uh, well, I have also watched those things, um, but I have also been watching MasterChef. Anybody um, watch trying bingo? to. <laughs> <laughs> Any calls that? a bingo yet? Uh, oh no! I mean, obviously, you get the stand, you get the standard, um, uh, the, the the standard, um, you know, cliches all the way through. But it, I, I, you know, Master Chef doesn't. It, you can't easily reinvent the wheel, especially during lockdown with Master Chef. Uh, it's not the professional, Stuart. It's Master Chef the amateurs. Although that, is although the person who's going to no, win it exactly. tonight, I suspect, is not an amateur in my no, opinion. No, <laughs> I, 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 that's a point of contention which we won't bore you to death with right now. But we, we the, the person winning, um, the person winning at the moment looks likely to win. Look, all three are good, but one of them is who works in a restaurant. Front no, of no, house, no, 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 Stuart, just, just, just Master Chef. There you go. That'll work. Yeah, there you go. So. That's cool. Um, um, yeah, the guy that works front of he works front of house in a restaurant, but looking at his cooking, he's been at the back of the house a bit too. I'm gonna yeah, guess. <laughs> so, but nevertheless, it's been they 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 worked. Master Chef has adapted surprisingly well to lockdown, considering the nature of the fact that it's normally quite up close and personal, and they normally go off and do stuff. And also, obviously, the fact that the catering industry is shuttered for the most part. 
Um, so, you know, that... They, I was they... wondering where, where they managed to find restaurants to actually film the latter episodes in. <laughs> Well, they made it abundantly clear they opened them specially. Yeah, they opened um, them specially under you know under lockdown circumstances. But no, I, I've I've enjoyed that. Um, there was something else I've been watching, and I can't for the life of me remember what it is. So I uh, ignore. Yes, that's the bad boy. Um, that's restarted on Channel Four now. The t- Taskmaster has moved moved to Channel Four last series, and it was a really awkward transition because they were caught on the hop by COVID. And some of the basic mechanics of the show suffered in the change during filming. So whilst I thought it was a perfectly watchable season, it wasn't vintage. This series of Taskmaster has been clearly developed from the outset with a view to it being done under social distancing. Um, and it's, I've, I've waxed lyrical about this programme dozens of times. It's shot on an extremely low budget and it's funny because it is essentially relying on comedians being nat- just naturally funny, either through talent or ineptitude. Mercifully, it allows them to be funny under both circumstances. I absolutely adore this program. You can um, you can watch both it and all of the preceding series of Taskmaster on uh, on the four uh, on demand or more four or whatever they're calling it this week. Um, I would say that season five, which was shot with Bob Mortimer, Sally Phillips, Nish Kumar, Ashleen B and Mark Watson, is the is one of the single high points of British comedy of the 21st century. And I'm not overstating the case. It's genuinely one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. So both enjoy the new series. And if you've never watched any of it before, then you've got an absolute treat on your hands because it's fantastic. Excellent. Good stuff. Graham Cartwright, thank you very much. He's just yeah. donated to thank you sir. through Super Chat. So thank you very much. That is appreciated. Steve, what have you been watching? Well, uh, busy on Fridays because we've got um, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which I'm really enjoying. I oh, it's got good. I think it's a good series. It's, it's, raised, it's addressing lots I've, of really only, interesting subjects. I've and seen I know one people, so far. Yeah, people keep going, oh, it's not as, you know, not as different and interesting as um, WandaVision. WandaVision wasn't that good, particularly the first three episodes, which were frankly an hour and a half. If I get the joke after five minutes, now you're just trying to be clever. Um, this is just good old school um, Marvel, but with but with some really interesting um, socio political subtext, which uh, is unusual. But uh, I think it's great. I think it's the interplay between the main characters. Zemo has been really good value. Um, Daniel Brühl as Zemo and um, Baron Zemo. He's made himself quite clear now. It's quite quite funny when they get onto a private jet as well. Are you rich? Yeah, I'm, I'm royalty basically. Uh, <laughs> I've been watching that. I've been watching Invincible, which is excellent. I'm really really enjoying that too. And, and for all mankind, which is also on a Friday, and I'm really, really enjoying that. And I've also been plowing my way through Hellstrom. I can't stand it. It's awful. But I've basically, <laughs> I've watched every single Marvel TV series. So this is the last one you before they moved to. This is the last Marvel it. TV series they did before they went to, you know, doing the Disney Plus shows. So I'm, I'm one episode to go. It's dreadful. <laughs> But in I, the I words through, of Magnus Magnuson, he's started, so he'll finish. I, 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 got, I managed to get through Inhumans, and that was dreadful too. And I'm going to get through Hellstrom, and then I'm never going to watch it again. But it's so I can bad say that uh, I, Tom wouldn't review it. <laughs> oh, it's just so miserable, and that, it never leaves. It's always in one location, and you're like, yeah. God. And then you go and watch something like One Division or, or, or Winter Soldier, you know, Falcon Winter Soldier. And I'm like, oh, this is so much better. Well, um, that's magnet. That's a magnificent an, an indictment. Must be. An indictment of that. That's just uh, off it must the be limit. utter, utter. <laughs> yeah, even Tom <laughs> wouldn't review it. Yeah, he just didn't want to spend that energy. Uh, yeah, I mean, what I've been watching. So basically, they but they all land on a Friday, which is slightly annoying. Um, rather than spreading them out during the week. Um, yeah. and I've been catching up on Family Guy. So uh, I realised I hadn't seen most of season 10 and anything up and for, I've, I've seen season 19. So I've got not that uh, nine, eight I'm, I'm, seasons. I think I'm the same. I've, I, I realized yeah. that I've, I've missed a hell of a lot. Loads. And it's, yeah. it's consistently funny. Consistently oh, so something something funny. I saw on, on Twitter earlier, my favorite episode of the Simpsons aired 25 years ago today, 22 short films about since Springfield. It's my favorite, favorite Simpsons episode. Yeah. It's, it's a big, not least because 
it could realistically only be done by a tiny number of shows, both live animation and animation, because it's heavily dependent on the subsidiary cast. It's not the main characters. Uh, and also, unlike a number of other great Simpsons episodes, it's not being despoiled by trying to do it again worse at another time. Yeah. It stands alone as a, tr as a truly outstanding achievement. 25 years old. I feel like having steamed hams this evening just to celebrate. <laughs> I, I hadn't realised just how bad The Simpsons has become until re uh, the other day I watched two episodes back to back that were pretty new episodes and they were god awful. The writing was terrible. The jokes fell flat. It just uh, lost it. It's lost yet, it a long time ago. Family Guy, 22 years it's been going and it's still yep. bloody funny. It's still consistently funny. Yeah, <laughs> Consistently absolutely. funny and it still yeah. says stuff. I can't believe how they get away with it sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I honestly don't know how they get away with some of the jokes that they the, say. There's the one about John Travolta. I'm thinking, like, why is he not suing them? I mean, I know yeah. it's true what they're saying. <laughs> but... no, 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 he can sue us. He, we've got less money than that. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I know it's true because I got a friend who was a photographer when he was touring Saturday Night Fever, which was produced by Robert Stigwood and RSO um, Records. He went on tour around the UK with John Travolta as the photographer. He told me some stories. <laughs> Which I'm not going to repeat on this for obvious good, reasons, but yeah, good, 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 good. don't yeah, repeat just, them. Yeah, yeah. you, you, you keep, keep them to yourself. <laughs> well, I have it. I have it from. I have it from first-hand witnesses. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it on that, and we'll move on, right? Kaz, what have you been watching other than stuff that you've been reviewing? Anything I was just going to just going to mention that Condo 007 uh, asked whether anyone's seen The Marksman with Liam Neeson. Uh, I don't think it's out here yet. I think it's end of the month. Um, but I probably have seen it because I've seen all his other, his other movies. Um, and uh, Stevie DR asked, do you have to see all the Avengers movies to watch The Falcon? Uh, I've seen up to Civil War. Yes, you have to watch. What have you, Stevie, what have you been doing? Why didn't you watch Endgame and have Infinity to, War? Have to watch. <laughs> they were quite big films. <laughs> if, if we worked on the principle, I've managed to see both of those and I funded Everyone in the world saw those well, two. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's no excuse. If you've got Disney Plus, yeah. they're in chronological yeah, They're all order. there, mate. <laughs> yeah. don't, don't just skip to Falcon. That makes zero sense. If you're going to dedicate time to watching some Marvel stuff, don't skip to Falcon if you haven't finished. To be movie. honest, at the very least... You know they are quite enjoyable. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, I know, mean, you I, can watch it without having seen the other films, but they'll be more enjoyable. Well, it'll I mean, be more enjoyable yeah. if you have. The whole setup yeah. is is surrounding well, by something that happens in the end of Endgame. Yeah, I mean, so <laughs> yeah. so really, you can watch it, but you'll be like, oh, what's what, that? What's what I way? found was I I could watch Infinity the the limited MCU films I'd seen up to that point. I watched uh, Infinity War and Endgame. And I enjoyed going back and then watching everything in chronological order and watching all the stuff that I hadn't seen. Because then suddenly things make more sense. So then when you went back and watched Infinity War and Endgame again, yeah. it made infinitely more uh and it was it was more rewarding so yeah definitely hmm. yeah they're all in there, they're all on Disney Plus. Just put yeah. together a weekend and, and go watch and it, yeah. watch them all. Watch Steve, them all. Steve, have you seen them on Amazon Prime? No, I was about to ask you if it's any so, good. Right, I've watched the whole 10 episodes. If you like American Horror Story, then it, it's very American Horror Story. Yeah, I, I was um, just slightly, not so much not put off exactly, but I just felt like after Watchmen and Lovecraft Country, I felt like, is it more of the same? Yeah, it, it is, yeah. I mean... <laughs> so that was it, that was my thing. It's like, like I, dialed, my, I'm going to go... Dialed up to 11, I mean... It, if if I'm honest, uh, I'd have probably preferred if it wasn't American Horror Story esque. They could have just had ten episodes, which were about yeah, well the uh, scariest stuff in Lovecraft country, yeah. the stuff that's true. Yes, like so, sundown counties. That's terrifying to think that you could be yeah. you know, lynched if you were black and caught outside when the sun had gone down. Yeah, I mean, and that's real. That actually happened. That's not you know that's not a horror story. That's reality. Yeah, um, and this was so, a, yeah. a minority family who moved into West Compton. I think it's like in the fifties, maybe. Presumably, yeah, that wouldn't be the case now. <laughs> yeah, so, so I mean, it was, um, you know, it's 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 very a very odd white picket neighbourhood where everybody does their best to make them feel. It's like moving into Stepford, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it was it, it's it's a horrendous <laughs> watch, but uh, you know, the, the, there is enough horror in the racism there, like real, yeah. real horror. Uh, I'll, I'll just say the words cat in the bag 
anyone who's seen it, Cat in the Bag will haunt you for the rest of your life. I mean, it's 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 a it's painful watch. Is it worth uh, me put, investing my ten hours into? Well, given that know, I just plowed through Hellstrom. The way you describe <laughs> Hellstrom, I was kind of sucked into this because I and I needed to get to the end. Can I muster the effort to write a review about it? I mean, it's, it's tough. It's it's somewhere between a, a six and a seven for me. It feels like um, the the racial side of it is extremely well portrayed. It feels like the horror side was largely unnecessary. So I'm kind of torn. Uh, I I would think that given the amount you watch, you should probably give it a show a shot. You will find out in a couple of episodes if you can stomach it, and if it's for you. And and then you'll force yourself to watch the rest either way. I did, I'm, I did I'm surprised you haven't seen it, Steve. I thought you watched everything. Well, I I watched. Um, I was going to watch it, and then uh, I got sidetracked by the the new thing on Netflix, the uh, Great Art Heist, or, or Rob. This is a robbery. That's right. Oh, this right. is a robbery, yeah. which was okay, but they could have told that story in an hour and a half, two hours. It didn't need to be four hours long. Um, but there's a new series coming out. I think it's next month called um, The Sons of Sam that I'm really looking forward to. <laughs> I Good old conspiracy watch, theory I, I too will watch and that a serial animal. killer. <laughs> but how infuriating! Once again, uh, you know, for the, uh, looking through Andy's expertly curated article on what's coming up, and there's one thing which has me hovering over not cancelling my Netflix subscription. Um, and yet, yet again, more, more sort of random. Oh content. no! Next month's good. Army of the Dead. I'm looking forward to that. There's some good stuff yeah. coming up in the Netflix. I'm. Next t- month. I, I don't know. As you know, I'm. I, I'm. I fire on fire on different cylinders to you, Steve. That, and that, at the end of this month, the, Disney yeah, Plus yeah. have got Nomadland. So excellent. Yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. Okay. Lots of good stuff coming. Lots of good stuff. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> and, 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 it's, that note. and it's eight thirty. So yeah, let's get this so, uh, finished. <laughs> I've got lots to catch up on. So I guess what I'm going to do uh, this weekend, Steve, I've, I've been planning this for a while. I'm ripping my rack to pieces. <laughs> oh, you and I'm, and poor I'm gonna... bastard. You do know, I know that obviously you've got different connections to the stuff I deal with in, an, in, in my system. You do know that if you systematically unplug absolutely everything in your rack and then put it all back together again, notionally in exactly the same way, but neater, one thing will not reconnect mm-hmm. in the same way. Yeah. Those are the rules. The chaos gods do not take a day off when you do this. It's it's a day long process too when you've got sixteen oh, yeah, yeah. to deal with. <laughs> I I put the whole I'm putting the whole day aside. You know, it's uh, it's like no, it needs to be done now. So uh, it's getting a bit dusty around about that. <laughs> oh, it, 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 it's such a spaghetti junction that I now can't pull the speaker cables far enough up to plug them in now because they're wrapped around each. Oh, I had each to other do. I had to do a um, a quick rejig on mine, and for reasons I cannot easily explain, other than sheer arseholery, one of my turntables will only work until one of the inputs on the phono stage, despite the fact that all four inputs are identical. It only works into one of them, and it's not the one closest to it. <laughs> and it's just like, what? Why have you done that? So yeah, you've got all that to look forward to, mate. Have fun. Yeah, yeah. but once it's all set up, I'm gonna uh, plow through some stuff over the weekend and watch some uh, movies and and so on. So get caught up. Um, but I can see myself now. Sunday night, I'll still be there thinking, why is this not working? <laughs> well, yeah, well, if mate- you do get it to work, I'd say Palm Springs would be a good starting point because it's a good old, you know, it's funny. It's yeah. time loop comedy. It's it takes it. It's got some interesting angles. Um, it assumes you've seen Groundhog Day, so they don't even bother. <laughs> they just start straight in the middle of it. I ended up going on a time loop, I um, mean, like a session, basically. I, after watch that, I watched The Map of Tiny Perfect. Which is on Amazon as well. That's which great. Is, which is on Amazon. Yeah. It's a really good film. Yeah. I enjoyed that. I, I ended up buying the Blu-ray of Happy Death Day. So <laughs> Happy, Happy, Death, Happy Death Day to You is on Netflix. So yeah. um, tomorrow night, I'm going to do a Happy Death Day, Happy Death Day 2 double bill. <laughs> the first one's better. But, uh, but I think it's funny. I mean, uh, Amazon should buy Boss Level and then they can complete the trifecta. Well, uh, well then Netflix have got Russian Doll, haven't they? Russian Doll. Yeah, them. yeah. So they should Boss be, Level, what's that one? That's the one with Frank Grillo and Mel Gibson. Is that a time loop thing? <laughs> yeah, that's totally. Oh. That's uh, Edge of Tomorrow <laughs> meets Crank. Oh, yeah. I should really watch Edge of Tomorrow as well. Edge of Tomorrow <laughs> meets Crank. Sold. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like Frank Grillo. <laughs> yeah, he's, it's great. I mean, someone has to buy it up. And Amazon, uh, they clearly like time loop movies. Maybe but then you need to watch that random episode. That random episode of, the, uh, of Star Trek Next Generation where... Um, 
uh, Worf utters the line which is used in that Orbital album. There is the theory of the Mobius. The Mobius. <laughs> I, 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 we watching Family Guy, the, the episode Back to the Pilot is great because once when Stewie and Brian go back to the pilot episode and then they have to keep going back over and over again. Yeah, yeah, stop, yeah. stop, don't stop, go stop. back. <laughs> the thing you do works, but that thing messes everything up. And eventually Stewie just goes back before he shoots himself in your eyes. <laughs> it's brilliant. It's really funny. Yeah. Ray, I think we've uh, we've exhausted the possibilities reached, reached, reached there. Reached the end. Uh, just very quickly before we start, Condo 007 said, "Am I crazy spending six thousand nine hundred ninety-nine pounds on the Sony A ninety J eighty-three inch?" Well, no, one, it, you probably no, that's quite wait. a reasonable price. Uh, yeah. they, but I, I would just say that uh, there's a review in the tank from me for a product for fourteen and a half thousand pounds, and just read it before you do that. It's not a television, but you want it anyway. So <laughs> yeah, go for that. Okay. Uh, seven grand for an 83 inch that's i've currently got a that's product that's seven thousand eight hundred quid and all it does is, is a video processor <laughs> well, welcome dynamic to my tone world. mapping if that's your thing <laughs> <laughs> there you go competition cars sure okay for your chance to win a copy of our podcast exclusive prize a discovery of which is season two on blu-ray which is based on the second book in deborah harkness's series shadow of the night use the following question to select the right answer which book is season two based on? Fine. Oh, is that it? Yeah, that's it. That this is not a discovery of witches. I am. I am. No, it's based on Shadow of the Night. I just gave the answer. I just. Oh yeah, sorry, I didn't read the whole thing. But, yeah, I've got the answers right there. So. <laughs> So that yeah, I don't know how people are guessing it right. I'm kind of annoyed because I can't tell when I'm drawing the prize which ones have just guessed it right. Look, some statistically. Well, you do know because the ones you're... that entered the, got it right before tonight. Oh, that's a good idea. I'm a no <laughs> Yep, you guys have all failed. Because <laughs> <laughs> the whole point is to make them watch this rubbish before they're allowed to enter the competition. <laughs> Not rubbish. <laughs> This quality yeah. entertainment. Yes, this quality entertainment. And if you have enjoyed it this evening, then please do hit that like <laughs> button because it really is important. Um, it serves us up to new people. So new people <laughs> whether come. they like it or not. Yes, whether they like it or not. <laughs> and uh, they can come and join our cult of AV. Um, but that's it for this week. My thanks to Ed Selly. Uh, that was an unconventional encounter. Kaz Harlow. I am the cavalry. And Steve Withers. One ugly ass bird. If you enjoyed the podcast, then please give it a like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell so you are informed every time we upload new videos. And there's new videos coming this week, uh, settings videos, a uh, video for the G1, and more. I'm even going to review WebOS 6.0. So you've had the insight tonight. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. You can book back if you so for this week's news and video. Plus, why not leave us a five-star rating on, uh, on iTunes or any other service that you listen to. If they allow it, then, then give us a rating. I'm Phil Hinton. Thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you again next week.